We're on this computer. Okay, now we're recording. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to talk about how the new legal uh, compliance rules impact you all as realtors. You may hear the word QM, which means qualified mortgage, or ATR, which is the ability to repay. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The TRID timelines, I would love to hear some of your stories too. I don't want to just be up here chatting away the whole time. I would love to um, have some interaction as well with you guys. So feel free to chime in, feel free to put any of your questions in the chat feature or could say Q&A, either one. And I will try to make sure I can watch those as we go through this as well. The big hot button is MSA is a more, uh, marketing service agreement. We don't see those as much as we used to, but um, do you guys have one with the lender now? An MSA? Misty? I don't know. Uh, I'm not licensed. I'm a, the office manager, oh. so. <laughs> okay. We okay. need to describe what it is because um, it could be. Well, a that's where you have an arrangement with one particular, um, could be a lender, could be a title company, where you may hear people say, this is my preferred lender or, you know, that kind of stuff. So it would, in, in the past and going forward, they've modified them a little bit, but, and we will get more in depth, but it would be, um, whatever agreement you like, we're going to give you so much money a month for oh. however you want to say it. You're basically getting money from another entity as in a lender or a title company is what most of the marketing, the kind of marketing service agreement. So let's play a game. And the game is who likes to play games? I love games. We do game night. We try to do it not as often as we used to, but now we can do zoom game nights. We did Bunko or not Bunko, but um, Bingo the other night. It was actually fun. But if you're in a world where everything's changing, right? Your rules change. You think you know what you're doing and you play by the rules and all of a sudden they say you're out because you didn't play by the rules. Well, that's kind of what's going on. That's really what's been going on in our mortgage industry for years. But fast, you know, fast forward to 2020 and nothing, everything that was up is down. What's down is up sideways is every which way. And it, it's insane. And what we did yesterday, we may not be able to do today. What we are doing today, we might not be able to do yesterday or tomorrow. So it's there's a lot changing on. I know you guys feel it too. You see it. Uh, lenders, I'm telling you right now, we, we got the, the gamut of it. But we're going to get through this together. So really what all this started was when Dodd-Frank um, enacted. And if you could put in the chat button how long you guys have been in the business. So if anybody was here prior to 2007, 2008, that's when all the crap hit the fan, if you will. <laughs> and a lot of changes were happening. There were a lot of things going on uh, with regard to lending and who was getting loans and that sort of stuff. And Dodd-Frank came about because there needed stuff to be changed. And I will 100% agree with that. What I don't agree with is senators and Congress people throwing in pages of this 832 page document law that they enacted the Dodd-Frank that just got thrown in there without really looking at what's the ramifications of this. How is this going to affect the industry as a whole, all that. And so for me, that's where I have the big problem. Let me make sure. Kelly, do you see the chat? I do. Okay. Because for some reason, I'm not seeing the chat feature. Six years, 15, 16 years. Oh, we have a 15 year, some six. 15 years, Miss. That's awesome. Who's the newest agent? Less than a year or a year? Any of them? Leslie's three months. Oh, nice. Who was three months? Wesley. Wesley. Oh, good job. Wesley. Oh, Wesley. Sorry. I can't hear either. <laughs> I'm telling you, I when I was teaching these, because I've been teaching these classes since 2012, and the loan officer would be go, well, are you doing any webinars? I'm like, no, I want to be in front of the people. I want to be belly to belly and, and do that. And now I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever be in person again. I love doing Zoom. It's awesome because we get to reach so many more people. You guys don't even have to leave your house. Don't you love that? Is that awesome? Do you like the Zoom or are you guys tired of Zoom? 
You like it? So anyway, so Dodd-Frank came about in uh, 2010 and they came up with proposed rules, final rules and amendments to final rules. So those of you that were in the business back in 2010, so that would be, you know, anybody that was, uh, Misty looks like might maybe just you, but um, there was a lot of, we didn't know who was going to do the closing disclosure. Remember that we were like, is title gonna do it? Is the lender gonna do it? What's it look like? Because prior to just a few years ago, we used to call it a HUD-1, that closing statement. Now the closing disclosure used to be called a HUD-1. So we had, and then the original numbers we would send to borrowers when they did an application was called a good faith estimate. And so then they turned, changed the terminology. And what I like most is there's consistencies. So the old good faith, which is now the loan estimate, the look of it is identical to the closing disclosure, where in years prior, the HUD-1 was all over the board. It didn't look. So I think for the ease of a consumer looking at it, seeing that level playing fair field, um, it helps them see if there's any mistakes or anything that a lender may have done that is not okay. So a qualified mortgage is, and I'm just going to go to this little chart here. Any, I have to back up because Prior to 2010, 2008, I should say, we had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were, they were private entities, if you will. And then when the whole mortgage market crisis happened, then it went into conservatorship with the government, Fannie and Freddie did. So now Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, USDA is all under the eyeballs and the watch of HUD, where prior years it was different at Fannie, Freddie, and then Jenny May, which is your government loan. So VA, FHA, and all that. So they are now in a conservatorship, if you will, and they have a safe harbor that is put in there because when they wrote the rules with the Dodd Frank, they were saying, okay, we can't have a back end ratio. Everybody knows what DTI is, right? Debt to income ratio, where we look at your gross income, we divide it by your debts that you owe and your current house payment, and we come up with a DTI. Well, we do automated underwriting right now in the lending world. And if we, we've we seen them up to 49, up to 50, I've seen some VA approval because they look at it a little differently in 55 DTI. So with the Dodd-Frank, they were saying, we're capping it, you cannot go over 43, period. Well, since 2010, these really haven't been enacted. It's sort of like if you have a automated approval, if your back end is 49 DTI, this over here where it shows maximum 43 doesn't apply. So we have some rules we gotta follow. We can't do any more any loan with a prepayment penalty is not allowed. For several years, we couldn't do interest only after 2010. And now we are in 2020 and uh, 2019, 2018, we saw some interest only. I personally don't do, I have not done an interest only loan since prior to 2008. It's not saying it's a bad product. It's just, we don't have, I mean, rates have been so good for so long. Nobody really needs to do interest only. We do see interest only a lot with HELOCs, so home equity line of credit, you'll see interest only, but they're a different breed. It's not necessarily tied to what we're talking about today. Does that make sense? Any questions? And I can't see the chat, so you're gonna have to just unmute yourself. How's that? Anything? Okay. So really you fell into one of the three buckets. Bucket one was, um, all your agencies, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, US, RHS is the um, USDA. They call it rural housing. You guys probably do a lot of USDA in Sandy, right? Because it's still an area that there's a lot of USDA up there. Is that true? Does anybody do a lot of USDA? Anybody? Okay. Then your bucket two is your non-agency, non-government qualified loans. So these could be... Um, any loans that have a unique feature. We don't really have balloon payments either. We saw a lot of balloon payments with adjustables prior to 2008. We don't really see a lot of balloons, but it's important to see that. 
And then the bucket three was your non-qualified mortgage. You're probably seeing information come over. Do you guys see where it says non-QM, non-QM mortgage, non-QM lender? Have you guys been seeing that? Yes or no? That's really just to be, that's the old subprime lender. Are we ever going to be to the lender where you fog a mirror and you get a loan like they did in 2007? No, but we do have lenders that will do a bank statement loan for self-employed person. So obviously the point of being self-employed is to have as many write-offs because we don't want to pay anything to the government, right? That's, that's how I would look at it too. But as a lender and an underwriter, they're going to look at what are you claiming as income in your tax return? Well, now in the last couple of years, we've had non-QM lenders come out and they are the ones that are doing the bank statement loans, or they might look at asset depletion and qualify a borrower that way. So things that are outside of a box or outside of your traditional lending, we do have avenues for that. Well, then what happened? 2020 happened and COVID happened, right? So earlier this year, we saw a lot of the lenders that did the non-QM, they pulled out of the market. They were like, oh, we're out. Peace out. We are done. And now we're seeing them come back in and they're, they're loosening up a little bit. They used to raise the credit scores and how much loan to value they would do, but now they're, um, they're loosening up a little bit more. And when I say loosen up, not to where it was prior to 2007, 2008, when it was, it, we shouldn't have been loaning 125% of somebody's value and saying somebody that works at McDonald's earns 5,000 a month back in 2007. You know, I mean, those are just, those are, that's not responsible lending. And I think everybody was drinking the Kool-Aid back then. I don't drink Kool-Aid, just kidding, no. But anyway, um, I have a lot of opinions, so don't take that to heart. That's just who I am. So anyway, so we look at the maximum debt to income. We really, the ability to repay really is, let's go back to old school underwriting. Let's make sure they have the money they have the down payment. If they don't have the down payment, well, where are they going to get it? Are they going to get it from uh, a relative? Are they going to get it from an employer? Are they going to get it from down payment assistance? Where, does, where do they work? Have they worked there for a while? Do they have steady income? Is it income that fluctuates? So we're back to what we were doing prior to, I think that really took off early 2000. So we're, we're back to what we were doing where we just want to make sure people can afford to make their payment. We want people to stay in their homes. We don't want them to not be able to afford it. So there's different ways we as lenders can help the consumer. One of it is we can reduce their monthly payment by buying the rate down. So you guys know that in the world of financing, there's things called points, right? So the point equals, it could be any percent. It could be a 1% point. It could be a half a percent point. It could be 0.625. It could be any combination of a fee. They call it a fee, but a, a percentage. And that means that if you don't have that point, you're getting that interest rate at par. So you're not paying for it to be lower and you're not getting any money back for it to be a higher rate. Because did you know that lenders are going to make money upfront in their fees or long-term in their interest rate? because lenders are here to make money, right? Makes sense. So when we're talking with clients, and I know Michelle feels the same way that I do about this, like I wanna show you options. I wanna show you, hey, if you took a thousand, or, you know, 1%, so on a $1,000, $100,000 loan, 1% would be $1,000. So if we got you for $1,000 more, we could help you maybe get a quarter better in your rate or an eighth better in your rate, depending on pricing that day. If you don't want to do that, here's what it is. And let's look at the difference in your payment. So I think a lot of people, they want to see that and feel it and touch it. They want to know, okay, you say points, no points, but what does that mean? So let's show you, hey, here are the numbers. Here's what it looks like. The APR was seller paid points. So when sellers pay any points towards the buyer in a transaction. And if you guys could put in your chat feature, what percentage are you seeing seller contributions on your transactions? Just, just shout it out. And then Kelly, would you just shout out what they're saying when people start typing that in? And then most of the time lenders aren't going to, but technically we can affect that APR if the seller ends up paying part of the points for the buyer. 
really the APR just shows people, hey, it costs you money to get this loan. That's not what your money is going to be accruing interest at. However, that's your effective yield your first year. Your interest rate is really what you're going to be accruing interest on and paying on that. So that would be another point. What's the percentage? Uh, no answer. Okay. Oh, you guys don't want to talk? Is that it? I want somebody to put in there, please. Please, if you would. Just put 3%. in there what percentage? Or 3%. 3% of your yeah. transactions do seller credits? Yeah. Okay. When and who was that talking? Is that Alan? That was Alan. He's gone now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to know, do you usually put an exact dollar amount or do you put, oh, like 1%, 2% or 3% when you do a seller credit? I usually put it up to a dollar amount. That's perfect. And it's especially nowadays, you guys, because lenders have to get pretty darn close to what those fees are. So I would rather have you call directors and say, hey, we have this transaction. The buyer's making an offer. Here's the address. We can look up the property taxes and we can say, oh, you know what? Based on what this buyer's doing, if they pay $6,892, then that buyer only has to come in with they're three and a half or 5% down or whatever their down payment is. To me, and as a, cons as a buyer and or as a seller, I don't want to say 3% because it may not be 3%. Most closing costs and prepaids doesn't add up more than two, two and a quarter, depending on how much the property taxes are per year. So I love that you put an exact dollar amount because I think that helps everybody um, really not have any money left on the table. Because you guys would not want that either, right? If we said we're going to pay ten thousand in closing costs, but it really only came up to seven thousand, nobody likes that, right? Nobody yeah, wants. We've to had a leave. couple. We've had a couple of those lately. I know, and then it's like, oh, how can we use that, right? Let's let's get that rate a little lower or something. So, I think then that's why it's important to really, you know, have conversations with the lenders, and if they're not having, they should be having conversations with you guys because we're a team, right? We're here to help that transaction come together. And if the team's not talking, how can you have a good game plan? So really- Merit. Yeah. Uh, if you're talking about paying uh, closing and prepaids, uh, there's a fair amount that I end up doing. Uh, but if you're talking about paying points, um, I almost never do that. I, uh, I'm, so I'm a little confused as are you talking about taxes and uh, broker payments and um, all the other things that come in with a closing cost, but uh, that's to me, and that's different than paying down points to get a better interest rate. I almost never do that. Yeah, and you know, and I don't know, and that's a great point, Carl. I don't know if you're seeing the cost worksheets that the lenders are explaining because they, the buyer could be paying points part of that. Because if we give you guys a dollar amount, like $692 or whatever I said it was, 6,892, of that, it could be half a point is part of the discount point or points for the loan. Unless you get an itemization, you don't really know what that is. But that's a really good point because if, and I want to be respectful of agents and sellers when I'm talking to buyers, because it's important to, if you want the absolute best rate, it might be your closing cost or $10,000. However, in today's market, we're seeing multiple bids, correct? Aren't we still seeing multiple yes. bids? Yes, yep. So you want to position yourself to the best. So if we can do it, work the numbers so your closing costs are only 6,000, not 10,000, you're going to have a better chance of getting that seller to accept that offer. So I think it has to be where, again, it's all about communicating. We want to help the buyer. Maybe all they have is that down payment money. Let's help them but you may not necessarily get the lowest rate, right? With the highest seller credit. And so that's what's important is community. Does that help explain a little bit like that? Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is, so instead of maybe, and uh, the next one is reduce debt to income ratio by reducing down payment and using the money to pay off other debt. Typically, you need $3 of income for every dollar of debt. So maybe instead of 
putting 10% down, let's maybe use pay off some of that debt. Maybe they've got some um, high loan or high um, credit card and maybe car payments that if we paid those off, then we could get a more house. So there's just ways to look at things differently is really my point with this. Um, the other thing is increasing your down payment, right? By getting gifts. A lot of people don't know that they can actually borrow against their 401k and pay themselves back the money. And they might have a better return doing that than what's going on in the market today. A lot of people don't know that they can do that. Or there's employers out there that give grants for people to purchase a home because buying a home, it makes a better employee, it makes a better you know neighbor. It's, it's just, it helps the all around, all consuming area because they're more apt to stay in their job. They're more, so there's, there's benefits to the employer and the employee if they do give that and some employers give that too. So there's a lot of different ways other than just a down payment assistance program or you know saving money and that sort of stuff. So there's different ways to do it. Is that helpful to hear that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. This was an extra slide that I was supposed to delete last night and it's right there. So this is the course number in case you guys wanna know. <laughs> so the TRID timelines. Let's talk about that really quick. And if you could unmute, share your story. Since we've done, this is the waiting period is what I wanna talk about. When, one of the changes with the, the TRID, which is the Truth in Lending RESPA Integrated Disclosure Act was, okay, we're gonna make sure that the consumer sees all the final numbers and has three days to review it, absorb it, think about it before they can even sign the loan documents. So that's what the TRID that I'm talking about. So has that had a negative impact, a positive impact? Would you guys like share a couple stories with your thought on that? Anybody? Don't be shy. Well, I think the only thing is if you have a change and you have to resubmit it and then all of a sudden the seller is you know, you have to extend the deal and yeah, and uh, it, it doesn't always work for the seller because he's got his moving van sitting in the driveway ready to move. Yeah, that's that's not good. That's not good at all. And there's certain things that will trigger that three day waiting period to happen again. You could have some things happen that not that don't necessarily trigger that three day waiting period again. So, and I think every lender is a little different. Director's mortgage, we, our stance is when we go for, when we have the final approval, typically when a buyer comes to a lender, they're gonna get pre-approved with them. They're gonna get pre-approved with their income, their documentation, all that stuff. And then that's when the lender will give you guys that approval letter. So we've got the buyer already approved. Then when they make an offer, then we go back into underwriting with all the property information, appraisal, if there is one, uh, prelim, any association in paperwork, anything like that. Then that goes into what they call final approval. We have been, once we have initial approval and pretty much most people are locking their loans right away. So we know what the cost of that interest rate is and whatnot. And so we're seeing that we can initiate that closing disclosure when we submit for final approval. And for me, I think that it's helped so that we haven't really been affected by that three-day waiting period, if you will. And I, but everybody, every lender is a little bit different, but I think that they're trying to help work through that so that people can still review the numbers, be responsible at what they're signing and go from there. So with the three-day waiting period, and I would say less than a tenth of a percent are people that don't use computers. There's still some people, I actually had somebody the other day that wanted me to mail them the application to fill out, not go online and do it. That's the first time in probably 15 years I've had somebody say they want an actual hard copy. So it's not very often, but you do have people that maybe you have to go through the mail. So with that, if you have to do it in the mail and not via the internet where they can just open it and 
e sign it, you're looking, it's like six days because you have to figure three days for mail time and you say, okay, they should have received it this day. There's nothing that we have to do to validate whether or not they received it, but we just have to do that timeline and then another three days for the waiting. So this is why it's important that, you know, your lender's communicating, making sure, hey, how are you, are you okay to receive documents via um, e-disclosure? So the, all the preliminary stuff we can do up front in e-disclosure and then at closing, they still go to the title company or have a, a notary come out. So then that can change. And then if you've got a refi, so maybe you have somebody that's doing a refinance, maybe to purchase an investment property. So then you've got the three day right of rescission in there too. So now we're looking at possibly nine extra days. So that 30 day closing, see how that kind of changes stuff a little bit, <laughs> depending on what the transaction is. So I haven't had anything negatively impacted per se. We our strive at directors is to have loan docs seven days, six days prior to closing. And I think this has shortened it. We're like three, four days before closing and that's including the three day wait period. So it's just, um, again, we needed to make everybody just slow down a minute. Let's all read what we're signing. We don't want to have it where somebody doesn't know what they're signing and somebody's, you know, we're not seeing a lot of switching, but you know, there could be situations where a mistake was made because it's human beings inputting this data, right? And people make mistakes. So, and that could be where maybe somebody did make a mistake and they had to redo that closing disclosure for that extra three days. Um, what are you guys seeing for your, what are you putting for closing dates in your area? Are you doing more than 30 days? 45. 35? 40, 45. Mm. I love you guys. That's awesome. And you can always have a conversation with the lender and just say, hey, we're going to put 45 days as our close date. However, if possible, you know, everybody would like to close sooner because it, it could happen. But um, the market is just so crazy right now. Just insane. And there's so much business and not enough bodies to do the work right now. So I think the timelines and explaining the timelines um, when you're in contract with somebody is a great way to set expectations up front. And as a lender, I think it's our duty to have conversations with you guys as realtors too, to say, hey, you know, um, I see that you've got, a th I had one the other day that said, oh, well, we'll do a longer closing. And then by the time they were going to accept the offer, it wasn't even 30 days. I'm like, how are you going to do a longer closing? So I feel comfortable and hopefully your lenders do that. I'm not going to tell you something that I'd rather rip the bandaid off and tell you, Hey, let's go a few more days after 30 days, you know, 35, 40, 45 is optimal. That's the best. But if you can at least get us 40 days, 35 days, it sounds so minimal, but it's so huge in the lending world, even that two or three extra days. And then if you have holidays in there and weekends, it's just, it throws stuff out. Last minute changes to your transactions. Huge, huge, huge. Anything, make sure your lender and your title company are getting any addendums. I've had it where there was a new purchase price or, you know, they redid the purchase price by like 5,000 and title didn't know and the lender didn't know. And it's just, you know, it could be an oversight. So, but I'm sure, do you guys have somebody that does your stuff, sends it to everybody when you do addendums? Is that your, kind of what you help Misty with? Like if you have transactions, do you coordinate that kind of stuff? Actually, Trace does all of that stuff. Okay. So that's good that they have a designated person, right? That can help. Right. Yeah. That really is so helpful to have that. So that you guys are doing what you do best, which is negotiating transactions and let somebody else do all the admin stuff, <laughs> because it's important to have everybody, all the players have all the information right up front and really watching your rate lock timelines. And this is something your lender should be communicating to the buyer for sure. If not you as your, as their agent as well too. And then the inspection and appraisal timelines are huge right now. Appraisers are taking a really long time just because of the sheer volume with what's going on in the market, plus all the refis that are um, in the market as well. And we saw a lot of 
appraiser is retiring and there's nobody news coming in. So, excuse me, we're losing appraisers, but we're not getting the number of appraisers we need to do the work. So really being aware of, especially if it's an outlying area, it might be maybe, um, you know, halfway up the mountain because you guys are in Sandy. So you might be doing all the way around Mount Hood and there might be certain areas that are taking a little bit longer. So I think when you know the property, you know the transaction, just having conversations. Hey, do you think it's going to take two weeks? It might three weeks. How long is it going to take to get that appraiser? So um, just keeping that. And what we do is we're ordering the appraisal up front. A lot of times, if we can get it in the queue, if you will, we can get the timeline started and then they are not going to be, uh, if the appraiser doesn't go out there, they're not going to get charged. So they will charge them up front because it goes to the appraisal management company, but they won't, if, if they, the pre inspection happens and maybe there's a big foundation issue and they don't want to buy the home, we still have plenty of time to pull back that appraiser and get the people money. My stance is that it, have that done up front so you're not playing the waiting game. If you wait seven to 10 days for that inspection period, and then maybe another two or three days to negotiate, we've already lost 15 days in that transaction, right? So let's get things moving. Let's not wait like we were able to do last year even. <laughs> this year is so different than last year. Does that help a little bit, kind of throwing those things out a little? Yes, no? Okay. RESPA. Oh my gosh. So here's your three requirements that would be considered a RESPA violation. If I, you give me a referral and I give you anything of value and it could be anything of value. Maybe I come and I clean your kitchen. That's a thing of value. I can't do that because then I would be in violation. Anything written oral. So this kind of constitutes uh, the mortgage service agreements that we talk, or mortgage, the marketing service agreements where a lot of people put it in writing. Here's an example. Nick, the real estate agent, thinks he needs to hand out three business cards when referring a lender. Is this true? What do you guys think? Yes or no? No. Correct. It is allowed. <laughs> so, and your company may have a different stance. So please, I am not trying to override if your managing broker says, no, this is how we're going to operate, respect it 100%. But as far as the RESPA rules, if, um, sorry, oops, I went the wrong way. Sorry, guys. If, um, you can say to somebody, hey, here is a lender that I work with. They get transactions closed, whatever. You can shop around if you want. There is nothing against RESPA that says you can't do that. And I think it's important for lenders, for realtors to have their team of people that they know are going to bring it home for everybody. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, if if your Windermere office says they, they're looking at that differently, I totally respect that. But as far as RESPA, you don't have to give out three cards and say, pick one of the three. Now, when you're talking about your reputation, so you want to make sure you're working with a lender that is going to be good for that client too, because your reputation is our reputation. Our reputation is your reputation. And I think it's important that we respect that and make sure that we get those things done. The other example is Nick, the real estate agent, wants Jane, the loan originator, to pay for an online lead generation campaign. Is this allowed? What do you guys think? Is this allowed? Yes, no? The answer is it depends. <laughs> So how this works is the loan originator and the realtor need to split the cost equally. Split the cost equally based on who gets what, right? 
who gets the lead, who, who has, are we sharing the space on the ad? Is it half directors, half Windermere? What's it look like? Because that's really what they're looking for is, is what's going on with that. Hmm. Another example. Nick wants the agent to pay for advertising. So not necessarily online, but advertising. Is this allowed? Again, it depends. It depends on uh, how much of what. Back in 2017, and I can't believe that that wasn't that long ago, um, the CFPB had an enforcement against Prospect Mortgage, and I believe it was Keller Williams down in Corvallis, Oregon, because they were doing what they call kickbacks to each other. So, and they were advertising and doing different things. And it was the loan officer had that expectation of that realtor that was doing the advertising campaign and online lead campaign that they would get the referrals of the people coming in, right? So again, the RESPA is very clear. If I give you anything of value and I'm expecting something in return, a referral in return, that is when we're gonna have our the violation and the red flags go off. So with Prospect Mortgage, um, they were hit with 3.5 million back in 2017. That's a huge fine for, I mean, considering it's probably not much on their bottom line, but that's an eye opener. And it's telling them that we're really watching. I know realtors, you guys aren't as scrutinized as much as lenders are, but I'm telling you the day is coming and they are going to start changing that. So it's just really important to, to not go through that. The other thing, um, Zillow was, I think they're still under investigation, but they were another one that they um, were under, under scrutiny by the CFPB because obviously Zillow with their lead sharing and is that Boomtown? Is that what Zillow is? I've never done Boomtown, but I've heard of it. Um, but they're violating the kickback orders too. If a loan originator contributed to a real estate agent's Zillow account contingent on an agent's mortgage loan referrals to the loan originator, they stated that would be a RESPA violation, which it is, and I get that. Are there people that are still doing it? Absolutely. Does that make it right? No. <laughs> so you're going to have that, but they're really big. Anything of value is what they're looking at, and it doesn't have to necessarily be a gift card, right? Somebody's like, oh, well, it's only a $25 gift card. It doesn't matter. A thing of value, a five dollar Starbucks. So Misty sent me a referral, and I talked to somebody, and we weren't able to do maybe we weren't able to do the transaction. So I said, "Hey Misty, here's a card. Thank you for the referral. A little five dollar Starbucks gift card." If Misty was mad at me, she could turn me into the CFPB and say that she just did a RESPA violation. I sent her a referral, and she gave me this. So it a lot of times it's not even the person that's gifting uh, or giving the gift and the person receiving it, it's somebody that might be witnessing it. So another lender might have witnessed it or another agent might have witnessed it or somebody you pissed off or whatever could turn you in. And it affects not only the person that gives the gift, but the person receiving the gift too. So just don't receive any gifts. Okay. Well, Perry, is, is that yeah. the, um cover things like insurance agents and uh, I don't know, <clears throat> inspectors and that kind of stuff, or was it only between loan officers and realtors? No, that's a great point because it is anybody, anybody that can, that gives you a referral of something that you could close a transaction on. So I think it's the next slide. Let me make sure. Yeah, so here's the one with the Starbucks card. Now, what about a closing gift to a client? What do you guys think about that? What if we give a closing gift? Think that's allowed? If you have your, if you can write it off as advertising, if you have your name on it. <laughs> so, and I'm gonna back up to that question. So if I can give a closing gift. You guys can give a closing gift because that's just thanking them for their business. Now that 
client that I just gave this closing gift, maybe we could go jointly and we do a closing gift together. Totally cool. Doesn't matter. We could split it however we want it. It's not a RESPA violation because that was a transaction we closed. Now, let's say Nick is the client and now Nick calls and says, hey, Alan and Perry, I have my brother wants to buy a house. You guys did such a great job. Will you take care of my brother? And Alan and I are like, absolutely take care of the brother. Now, if we give a gift to Nick, who is the consumer, that's a RESPA violation because that's showing that we ex we giving something of value for a referral to us. And he's not licensed in any capacity. Does that make sense? So even uh, insurance for sure, anybody licensed is going to be under a whole different spotlight. So it's definitely not right. But even somebody that's not in our industry, we cannot give a, um, a gift, if you will. Now, what about, does anybody do, um, like, what is it? Uh, sorry, my brain's just not firing up today. Um, like annual parties, like um, your clients your, that you did for the year or something. Does anybody client do appreciation. client appreciation? Do you guys do that? Anybody do a client appreciation events? Not with we coronavirus. Yeah, well, through that. Prior to Corona. <laughs> Did you guys do that? We have before, yes. So uh, how that reads, and I'm telling you, my gosh, I heard stories. Um, one lender was taking his, her, it was a her, her top real estate agents to Mexico every year that would give them so many transactions, huge RESPA violation. Um, so if it's open to anybody to come to that party and anybody, so if, if I had a, I just opened a new office at the waterfront in Vancouver and I, it's because of COVID, we can't have a grand opening or anything like that. But if I were to have a client event and I opened it up to everybody, all the realtors, even ones I haven't done business with, not a RESPA violation. However, if I only sent an invitation to the top five realtors that sent me, you know, five deals that year, you're tying it to something that they, they referred you a dollar amount. So that's so blatantly obvious, but you kind of get my drift with that. Like you can't tie it to anything. You can't, you have to open it up to anybody could come in and join the party or whatever. You can't have a, like a list at the door and it says, Oh, you're not on the list and somebody says well how do i get on the list well you have to send so and so a buyer or a seller or a transaction that would be a huge violation so they're really watching to make sure that you're treating everybody equally and you're not um blatantly being obvious with people that send you business that you're i wish we could i really do i wish you know we could say thank you in ways that help people but they they don't allow it so uh, marketing service agreements. So the referral neutral policy, that's really basically, again, that um, anybody could be at that point. What we're seeing now is a lot of lenders, directors has a couple with a couple um, real estate offices. And what we do is we have an office in each of their offices and we pay a percentage of squares. And it has to be literally, if it's an office, what percentage of that office is counted towards the lease and it has to be something that you would be able to lease anywhere in that area for that same price. We can't overinflate it, can't underinflate it. It has to be the going rate. The other thing is people are doing um, helping with internet lead, not leads, but being a sponsor on your website. And we can pay money for that because we are there just to advertise as well with you guys. So that's considered okay. So there's just different things to look at that. But if we ever get audited, we really have to make sure that everything is tried and true and that you have that little office in, let's say it's, you know, a 2000 square foot office space, and maybe I have 300 square feet, I'm actually paying that percentage of the lease. I'm not paying any more, I'm not paying any less. I couldn't pay $1,500 or 
$1,000 for that little teeny office space. Same thing with ads. So if we're doing an ad and I have my little photo here and the rest of the ad is the realtor, the lender can only pay that portion that they have exposure to, okay? Um, One of the things that always comes up and maybe you can't answer this is <clears throat> agents paying uh, home warranties for sellers. Mm -hmm. You think that's a RESPA violation? You know, you guys are again under a different rule than we are. However, what I would see if, and if, if it was my office I was managing, I would make sure that we're offering it for every seller or for every buyer. So if you're doing it, you're offering it every time. Like why would you offer it one time for this person and not this person? Because that could open up a door of, especially if there's any racial disparity or di differences, you could be just a whole can of worms to get into. What's your thought on that? Well, my standard practice, is, which is pretty, uh, you can kind of, anybody can see through it. You reduce the amount of the commission yeah. paid by the seller by the equal amount of the home warranty and then pay for it and have the yeah. seller pay for it. Yeah. Is that how it's typically done is you just lower the commission and then the seller pays for it? Well, that's, that's what I, that's what I wish for. It doesn't always happen that way. Yeah. But. I think that's very clean. And like you said, it's obvious, but you're within the letter of the law, right? Well, that's what I think. Yeah. I think so too. And I say, if, if that makes you feel better doing it that way, I would just continue doing it that way. Unless obviously, you know, management has another take on that, but I think the cleaner, the better. But I also think that it should be, if you do start doing that, so maybe newer agents, if you start doing that, make sure you're doing it for everybody, right? Or have a really good reason why you did it on this transaction and not another. But like I said, you guys aren't under the microscope like we are, but you will be. I guarantee you will be. So just start the practices now on keeping it clean for, you know. I I don't want anybody coming. Like, I don't want the IRS auditing me. I don't want, you know, the auditors that come in and, and do on our books. I just want to keep everything clean. <laughs> I want to be able to sleep at night, too. <laughs> Who, uh, who audits RESPA violations? Is it the IRS? Who what? Who audits us? The IRS? Oh, I meant like if you're, your taxes, like if you get audited no. by the IRS. Like well, I'm who always watches, gonna be 100%. Who watches for RESPA? Who so RESPA, RESPA, yeah. So RESPA, um, it's the government does. I don't know, it's not the IRS. Um, the C CFPB is sort of the enforcer. They haven't had the biggest not exposure, but have, have, haven't have since um, we've had the new person in office. So that sort of went to the wayside a little bit, the CFPB, which is the federal entity that did the enforcement. But what we saw was the state sort of took over and started doing more enforcement. So it wasn't that the rest of it went away, but um, I think the government had other things that they were doing instead of enforcing that. Does that make sense? So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about the ability to repay and we talked about the TRID. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. I have a we have a few more minutes. If you guys, I want to share some uh, flyers that I want to send to you guys. Are you guys cool for a couple more minutes? Okay. Sure. So I'm going to stop sharing this. Then let me get out of here. Did anybody learn anything new today? No? It's all good information, yeah. Good. I want to make sure Hello, that I'm boy. providing something of value, you know? So let me open up. Where, is it? Where are they? Let's see. Trying 
to find them. I have like three screens up, so I apologize. There they are. Okay, let's move that over there. This is a fun thing to chat about really quick. What do you guys think is gonna happen? Do you think the rates are gonna be affected by the election? What do you think? Anybody yes. wanna, anybody Remember wanna there's talk? uncertainty and there is a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> Well, you know, they, um, the reason they're so low is they're really artificially low due to what's going on with COVID. They should not be as low as they are, as long as they have been. I mean, when I say that, it's not like it would be a lot different, but. So here is this article. So part of, do you guys see where it says, how will the presidential election impact? I can't read it, it's too small. Here, let me make it bigger. How's that? I'm an old guy with bifocals. So, <laughs> so this is an article. I am part of CMPS, which is Certified Mortgage Planning Specialist. I've been with them since 2006. And really, I wanted more education before they made it mandatory for us to get education, just because I wanted to really understand more the financial impact, not just doing a loan, but how does this help with somebody's financial situation and whatnot, and learn the rules and the laws and blah. So this is what this article came from, and it it talks about over the past year. So in 2016, the rate shot up by a point within 60 days. And this was mainly due to the stock market rally, right? So, excuse me, I don't know if you guys are aware that interest rates are based on mortgage-backed securities, bonds, if you will. And so when people feel very confident in the economy, they're like, you know what? we're gonna get into stocks because we're supporting the businesses, we're supporting the government, blah, blah, blah. When there's some uncertainty, they pull out of the stock market that might be a little bit more risky or a little bit more volatile, and they'll go into a bond or a mortgage-backed security that is not gonna have a, as high a yield, but it's going to be a little bit safer vehicle. And that's really what dictates what our rates do, is people getting out of bonds, investing in the stock market, you're gonna see our rates tick up. And this again, is any year other than 2020 because this year everything is throwing everything off, but and a normal, which I don't even know if we'll ever have normal again, but anyway, you kind of know what I'm meaning. Like it's depending supply and demand is how rates are based. So that's really why we saw that, that shift back in 2016. In 2012, um, there was no change. And in 2008, it was about a 1% within 60 days again. And part of that was because what's 2008? That was the year after the whole mortgage market meltdown, right? And then what we had, what we saw the government doing is buying um, the bond, they did the bond buying program. And over the past few years, they've been trying to taper that back. Well, and they were trying to in December of 19, is not buying any, not doing any. Well, then of course COVID hit and now they're back. They had to go back buying that to just keep the rates going, just keep it going. So I just think it's interesting. Do you guys want me to send this out to you? It's just a fun little article to share. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, send it out. Thanks right. for the information. And then the other one, let's see if I can get that over here. Not that one. Um, Oh, it's over here, sorry. Now, do you see how the Fed impacts mortgage rates? Can you see that one? Yes, okay. So this is a really good one and I'll make it a little bigger. That really talks about how the Fed impacts the mortgage rates. So you may or may not have somebody, you know, have conversations with you about that. And it's important that you can be a reporter, share information. You're getting information from me, passing it along. You're just basically reporting. Sort of like when I talk about this stuff, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an accountant, I'm not an attorney. However, I'm gathering information and I'm sharing it with people. So I'm like a reporter. What I don't want to see is where people are talking interest rate or things like that, because as a 
a realtor, you make sure you, you don't quote rates because then you're doing what's called a loan origination activity. So just be aware of that. Um, but there's nothing wrong with sharing information that you have received. And I strongly encourage that and, and get to know how do things work? How is this going on? How is this working? So with the, this is the, um, how the Fed impacts the mortgage rates because right now um, they're up to 1.979 trillion, which that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of billions, but so you'll see prior to 2008, they didn't do any buying. Do you know who the number one buyer of bonds prior to 2008 was? Anybody have a guess? It was China. China was the number one buyer of, of bonds in America. And then the market crashed, right? And they're like, peace out, we're done. <laughs> and so that's when, you know, we needed to have that to sort of keep that going. So is this information of value too? You want this? Cool. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing really quick. Okay. How do you guys feel about the market? And again, I like just having conversations. So if, and if everybody, if anybody has to leave, I get it. You did your hour time and you'll get your hour credit. But when somebody says, oh, what's happening in the market? What's your, tell me what you, what's the conversation you guys are having with people? Like, oh, it's going to burst again. There's going to be a bubble. What's your take on that? Unmute, we talk. Somebody's got an opinion, unmute people. I know, right? Come on, Pete. You're, come on, I know you do. At this point, there's not enough sellers. It's obvious to me because everything I do anymore has got, they're bidding the price up and yeah. And people are not uh, getting the houses they want to because they lose them to somebody who's got way too much money, not enough yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. And, and like I said, uncertainty for me means all kinds of risk. Risk means people are going to be conservative. Banks are starting to be more conservative. Yeah. I think that that's going to mean that after the elections, we'll probably have interest rates go up. People will kind of settle out whatever it is that we're doing here and. Yeah, I think they also the coronavirus thing is going to have to settle out some before yeah. people feel more comfortable to have folks run through their house, yeah. go out and look around. There's a lot of things that are affecting it right now. Yeah, it could be a lot. I mean, obviously with Corona, I mean it stopped a lot. But one of the reasons why we're going to be okay in our real estate world is because back in 2008 we weren't okay, like, right? We weren't okay. We were so overinflated with values and whatnot that that's really why it, it did the crash, if you will. Whereas now going into the coronavirus, going into what we've been having to deal with, we were okay. And that's why I love the people that are just now getting, even just now. So the one that was three months, I love that you're here in real estate. If you can survive this, you can survive anything, you guys. I'm telling you, it's it's a great market. It's sort of that food, shelter, clothing. People always need shelter, right? They need to have a roof over their head. Rates are, or excuse me, you know, rent values are off the chart. So I've seen time and again, people are buying homes cheaper than they're renting. So it just makes makes a lot of sense. So um, oh, this has been a wild ride. Yeah. Go, go yes. Oh, I just was curious, are there uh, a lot of delinquencies now? Are we going to see foreclosures again? You know, we were so low for so long. And um, yes, especially with the forbearance happening, it's still, you know, it's a small 4%, I believe is the percentage, but still each area is going to be a little bit different. And I think they're going to be surprised when they come out of the forbearance they may have to come up with this money and who knows, maybe they won't be able to, or, you know, maybe they're going to need to sell if they couldn't make the payment, you know, cause there's still a lot of people that aren't back to work. I don't think so has the situation changed that caused them to go into forbearance or whatever the case is. But yeah, I definitely, if you guys have done any short sales, um, foreclosures and like that, definitely sharpen your skills, you guys on that get the knowledge because that'll be a great avenue. I think in 21, 22, we're gonna see a big increase in that. And why not be in the forefront? 
you know, that's my opinion anyway, but yeah, it's a great point. Great point. There's opportunity to help people. And I think most of us get in this business because we truly want to help people and just thinking of ways to help people do that and um, do that. Now I have a class that we have somebody from an appraisal management come in and talk about appraisals. Have you guys had uh, somebody come out and talk about appraisals and what's going on in the market with that? No. Would you guys like to see that? It does a really good job. So sure. we're going to be here next month. Do you want me to see if he could come out uh, in December or do you guys want to not do anything in December for class? I think if it's early enough in December, that's fine. It depends if you can do it the first couple of weeks. Yeah. So you guys are so, usually uh, the, is it the second Tuesday? Every Tuesday oh, at 930. Every Tuesday oh, every us. Tuesday. So if we could get something like the first Tuesday in December, you'd be open? Yep. Okay. Um, so next week, or excuse me, in November, we're going over kind of the mortgage market, what's going on. And I have some really good handouts for that as well, too. And just talking about what's going on. How can we make sense of it? And I would love to see you guys be on that one as well. Do any questions while you have me live? Uh, speaking of appraisals, have you seen a lot of low appraisals coming in? You know, I haven't. Um, I have seen low appraisals with regard to um, refinances. Knock on wood, not with uh, purchases yet. Not Hopefully not yet. Not at all, but... What we're seeing, even on some purchase transactions, have you guys heard of the term appraisal waiver, a PIW, property inspection waiver? Yep. So we're seeing a lot of our refis are getting it and I've had a couple purchases and it's all based on an algorithm and it we're seeing some in property inspection waivers, which is awesome. I like to see that, but um, that way you don't have to have an appraisal, but that brings a good question. If you had a property inspection waiver on yours, would you want to have an appraisal or would you be fine not having an appraisal if you were buying a house? What do you guys think on that? Well, I want an inspection. I got, yeah. Just as a buyer, I want to know what's going on with my house. So inspection, yeah, but what about that. appraisal where it's talking about value? Would you still want to have it? From a uh, agent's purpose. I, I love the not having the appraisal because it it means that we're going to get the job done no matter what the value exactly. of the Exactly. Yeah, I agree, Carl. I agree. But I guess it depends if you're representing the buyer or the seller. So what if you were the buyer? Would you want to have an appraisal? Well, what if you weren't the realtor, but you were the buyer? You would know that uh, the appraiser is, is uh, verifying the value you're paying for the property. I kind of think so too. I know, but, and I'm just kind of talking out loud because I was wrapping my brain. I'm like, gosh, I would want to know that that value, but I know the algorithm that they use and it's usually with Fannie or Freddie. Those are the two conventional ones. We never see it with a government loan, but Fannie or Freddie are the ones that it would pop up. They do an algorithm where if you're at least within range and you've got a strong borrower good scores, maybe some good reserves, reserves are money that's sitting in an account, but they're not using it. You know, you're going to see an appraisal waiver. So as I've kind of, cause I would be like, I would want an appraisal. I mean, for the last six months, I'd be like, no, I would want one. But now I think I'm changing my opinion of that going, you know what though, they wouldn't give it to you if it wasn't pretty close in range. You know what I mean? So anyway, I just thought it was interesting. I love getting your guys' feedback. Thank you. And I want to thank you so much for being here today. No, thank you thank so much invitation. having you guys let me come in and hang out with you guys for an hour. So thank you. And we'll thank have a couple more classes coming up. How's that? Good. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to send out handouts. We'll send out the recording. It might take a few more days for the recording because it kind of gets a little muffled, but we'll get the handouts out and um, get you that, another copy of the flyer for the one in November. And um, if you want, I can sign all of you guys up for the November class, so you don't have to worry about it. Are you cool with that? Sure. Yes. Cool. Fun. Yes. All right. Thank all you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.
Same to you. We'll have a short meeting after. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.